The following is brought to you by Vertical Vet. Rethink your GPO. Hello again. I am Dr. Ernie Ward, Executive Director of Education for Vertical Vet, and it is my honor and privilege to bring you back once again for one of our Vet Med School live seminars. And today it is all about cancer, but a very specific type of cancer, one of the most common, if not the most common cutaneous cancer we deal with, mast cell tumors. And today we've got two experts to discuss an exciting new change, a novel type of treatment. Uh, I mean, this is completely transforming the way we address mast cell tumors. So I just can't, I can't wait for you guys to learn more from them. Today we are honored to be with Dr. Cristiano Von Simpson from Veerback and of course, Dr. Pamela Jones, who is known to all of us because Anything with oncology and radiology, she has been there for so many of us. And thank you guys so much. Uh, guys, I want to just thank you for, for joining the, the Vertical Vet family today because we've got some exciting news. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you for Ernie. Us. Pleasure Sorry. being here. Yeah, listen, uh, Cristiano, I, I just want to kind of jump into it. I mean, it's this, this drug is called Stelfanta. It is just, again groundbreaking. I mean, in my career, you know, there are a few little sort of capstone events that happen that really change the way we treat something, you know, they're transformative. And uh, this is one of those events for me. And so maybe just for people that have not been paying attention for the past several months, explain what Stelfanta is. And then Dr. Jones, I'd like for you to kind of, you know, give us some of the details and the nitty gritty. But, you know, from your perspective at Veerback, I mean, what, what is Stelfanta and why should veterinarians be interested? Yes, you're, you're correct, Ernie. It's it's real innovation, right? It's a new molecule from a new family that hasn't been used before. And it's also a new approach for cancer treatment. Uh, not uh, metastatic cancer, not advanced cancer, but the primary control of mast cell tumors. So Stelfanta is a new drug that gets injected direct into the tumor and will destroy the tumor. And, and Pam can certainly give you more details on how it works and what exactly it is. Yeah, I'd be happy to. In fact, um, Ernie, if you want to put up the slide, I'm going to give you the, the 30 to 45 second mode of action. And essentially, you know, it harnesses what's going on there within the tumor by, by um, recruiting the innate immune cells through an acute inflammatory response. It causes oncolysis of the tumor cells that are in the highest dose of the drug. And then finally, it activates protein kinase C within the tumor vasculature. That all leads to tumor necrosis. And really the interesting thing is the wound healing properties because it actually disrupts biofilms, therefore having an antimicrobial effect. And it also enhances wound healing. Yeah. And there's a lot to unpack there, guys. So <laughs> probably have to rewind the tape a few times. But in in, in it's uh, Pam, I, I think the discovery of this molecule bears repeating because I, I find that fascinating. So maybe you could just share quickly like how did you guys come up with this or who came up with it and how? Yeah, so QBiotics is the group that I work for and they've done the research and development. But what they did is they go through a uh, procedure called ecologic where they observe the rainforest and they observe what the critters and the plants and how they're dealing with stresses. And they realize that all the little marsupials in the rainforest love the blushwood tree fruit, which is Fontania picrosperma. But yet they would get down to the seed and they would spit it out, which was an advantage for the plant because it's seed dispersed. But why they would need it was kind of, you know, querysome to the investigators. And they discovered this was on the surface of the seed, giving a bitter taste to the seed. Right. But then there's more to the story because <laughs> you know, what, what I find fascinating is that, I mean, and again, to, to my veterinary colleagues and veterinary technicians that are watching this, I mean, this is something that not only destroys specifically cancer cells, but then aids in the healing process. I mean, that is remarkable. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And, and the more that I have talked to veterinarians using it on a on a day to day basis is the what amazes me is the ones that are, are big time surgeons, they love to do surgery. They're like, I can't get wound healing like this on my own sites. Yeah, and I think that bears repeating, Cristiano, because, you know, we're used to taking things out, closing things up, 
and yet this behaves very differently. I mean, you know, th this is, and, and maybe that's something we should talk about too. You know, I mean, it, this is a remarkable molecule, and, and if you don't know about it, you need to definitely go to the Verbach uh, website because uh, reams of research, literature, diagrams, anything educational to share with your clients, with your team, it's there. Well done. But Christiana, let's talk about that. I mean, we are used to taking something out, closing it up, and this is kind of a very different procedure. So maybe you could just briefly describe how do you use Stelfonta? Yes, it is a very different procedure. And that's, uh, there's a, a quite a few paradigm shifts. The first one is, yes, we are used to do the surgery, take the tumor out, uh, try, of course, to get those adequate margins, close it up, stitch it up, and send the dog home with a big E collar so it won't pull the stitches out, uh, <laughs> some antibiotic coverage maybe. Uh, with cell fonta, First, you don't do the surgery, right? The, the, the drug will kill the vasculature that is going to that tumor, kill the tumor cells. The tumor is going to go black, go necrotic, and fall off, which, by the way, the owners love to see the tumor die. And then you have the tissue deficit there where the tumor was that many, many times is kind of smaller than what the margins you would get because the drug is, is kind of targeting the, the tumor itself. And then what we see is a very fast healing, but not only that, the quality of the healing is the part that I really like. Because when I looked at that tissue deficit, particularly in some parts of the dog, in some areas on the face or some difficult areas, I was expecting to see fibrotic tissue that contracted, you no know, hard scar, and you don't see that. What you see is really the, the normal tissue grow back in many cases, in small tumors, you no. Know, after 40 days or so, you can't even find where it was. In the, the larger ones, you see maybe a little line or a small soft scar. So cosmetically and functionally, you get amazing healing. And people love it. You don't need the e-collars. You don't need the antibiotics. The drug is doing everything. Uh, we had a vet from Tennessee the other day describing it, and he said, this is a crockpot situation, folks. You put it in, and you wait it, and it's done. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny and, and so accurate, in fact. I love it. A crockpot solution for mast cell tumors. Well, well <laughs> Dr. Jones, do you have like any pictures or diagrams that could maybe illustrate, you know, this healing process? What happens, you know, what it looks like? Because I, I know a lot of vets that haven't experienced it, they probably have, have those questions. Yeah, I, you know, again, if you pop back to the, the last mode of action slide, um, you know, when you look at the top row of pictures, I mean, literally, this is one of those things that when you inject it into the tumor within hours, you start to see the swelling, the bruising, the erythema. And then by three to seven days, that tumor has necrosed. It's peeling away from the normal tissue. And it's amazing the granulation bed that's left behind. And again, that's because those wound healing properties and you actually get stimulation of keratinocytes and there's key genes that are upregulated and downregulated in response to um, the drug. And that's again, where you get that nice linear healing. Um, it's actually fantastic. And, you know, the owners, it, as we prep owners for this and we show them photos of different cases and such, um, they literally embrace this. They are excited that the wound tumor is dying off. They're excited about the healing. And they also report to me that for the most part, you know, after the first few d days, the dog just acts perfectly normal and tends to leave it alone. Yeah, I would agree with that assessment as well. That the dog just seems to not notice you know, what's going on at all. It doesn't bother them at all, uh, which is, again, confounding. And it, it, as, as Cristiano said, it's a paradigm shift in how we think and approach mast cell tumors. Uh, one thing, too, though, Cristiano, I, I guess we do need to get out there is, I mean, there are limitations to Stelfonta's usage on mast cell tumors. So maybe if you could just briefly describe like what it's indicated. When, when, it, when are the best cases for the use of Stelfonta in mast cell tumors? So Stelfonta is indicated for, for cutaneous mast cell tumors all over the dog. So any place, any location, there's a maximum size of the tumor. You want them to be smaller than 10 cubic centimeters, which is a fairly large tumor. Uh, and, but you can treat them any place in the dog. For the subcutaneous mass tumors, Stelfonda is indicated for tumors below the elbow and below the hock, so on the distal part of the limbs. The reason for that is that uh, as the tumor dies and you get that necrotic tissue, you want it to fall off, to drain out of the dog, to leave the dog. In the 
subcutaneous tumors that are on the body of the dog, they can be a little deeper because there's more tissue there. There can, there can be a fat layer or even a, a, a tiny muscle, muscle layer on top of it. And you don't want a tumor, a necrotic tumor, uh, to be trapped under that uh, layer of tissue. On the distal part of the limbs, that's not a problem. There's not a lot of tissue there anyway. So they will, they will fall off, they will drain, and the wound will heal pretty nicely. So, Dr. Jones, any other additional you know, questions that you may be able to anticipate that you're hearing from vets around the country about its use? Like, when is the right case for it? You know, is this too big? Is this the right size? Is it in the right location? Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of things when we think about case selection, and and certainly there's I always say there's tumor factors, there's patient factors, and there's owner factors, and it's certainly one of those things where you need to consider whether the normal anatomy is intact and such. But by far and away, again, I I have um, clients call me, clients veterinarians call me and ask me, well, what about the muzzle? What about the nasal planum? What about down on the digits? And again, these are all appropriate areas for depending on the case. Um, I think by the you know paradigm shift is all I can say about this drug over and over again, because we're not only injecting directly in the drug, but we also are dosing very differently. And if you wanna show the slide very quickly, I just wanna remind people that we are constantly looking at um, measuring tumors, doing length times width times height, and that is really the volume of a cube. So what we want to do is multiply times one half. And then the dosing is odd because we're not um, doing a milligram per kilogram. Um, we are actually dosing 50% volume of drug for volume of tumor. So it's one half mil for a cubic centimeter of tumor. And as Cristiano mentioned, there are maximums um, because we don't want to have that little dog with a very large um, mast cell tumor, be it high risk for degranulation events. Yeah, and I want to get into that in just a second. But again, if you're watching this today and you're going, well, that's a lot of math and that seems complicated <laughs> and I don't think I can do it accurately. I mean, uh, you guys developed a calculator that I think is just yeah, amazing. It makes this so easy. So, Cristiano, I mean, explain a little bit about actually what you can do to make this super convenient for vets. This is, <laughs> this is amazing. I love this calculator. So, no. Uh, the veterinarians here on this side, on Verbeck and on QBiotics, we realized how many, how, how much different this is, right? And we tried to make it really easy uh, to make that change. So we, if you go to the Stelfonta website, Verbeck, uh, at the Verbeck website, at the Stelfonta pages, we have all the visuals so you can see different tumors in different locations. We have all the research, but we also have this nice calculator when you when you measure the tumor the three dimensions the length the width and the height and you put them in you put the weight of the dog it will automatically spit out the dose for you and it will also automatically filter for the maximum dose and the minimum dose uh, so you'll be accurate you'll be within the label guidance and you won't have any problems with that yeah and i will tell you colleagues, it is incredibly easy. I, I love, I wish more drugs had calculators like this because, you know, often we're relying on our, our staff to, to help with calculations in a busy day. And this really uh, is, is seem, it's easy to use. Um, yeah, Jones, Ernie, what, what we're recommending people to do and, and many people are doing is just bookmark that on your cell phone on or your clinic computer. So with one click, you go straight to that. It's really easy to do. And I can tell you, it looks great on your cell phone. So, you know, again, yes. Apple and Android, it looks fantastic. So it's easy to work from my phone. Uh, Dr. Jones, one of the biggest, you know, concerns that, that we've had historically with mast cell tumors is the risk and fear of degranulation. In fact, you know, I know a lot of veterinarians are like, wow, I'm even nervous to do a fine needle aspirate of certain tumors because of this fear. Maybe you could walk us through what you should do to prepare a patient for treatment with Stelfanta and, and maybe help allay some of those concerns. Yeah, Ernie, it's it's very important because you think about what I just told you earlier about mode of action. You know, this is not like poking a 22 needle, you know, gauge needle into a mast cell tumor. This is literally hitting it over the head with a bat. So what you want to do is there's a very important concomitant medication schedule. And if you want to pull up this slide, you know, it, there's three parts to it. One is anti-inflammatory corticosteroids, and that's to start two days prior to the injection. Again, get on board that anti-inflammation. The other thing about that is we also have on H1 and H2 blockers. And again, this is all to protect the 
that patient from those first five days of, of the highest risk of degranulation. Um, you'll also notice on that chart, we have pain relief. And certainly, again, you know, I, I encourage all veterinarians to consider preemptive analgesia because we are causing inflammation and necrosis. And as, as um, you know, Cristiano can reiterate in our discussions with general practice veterinarians, it's those initial few days where between degranulation and analgesia, all these medications are very important. Yeah, and it's, it's really not that complicated. I mean, if you, and I encourage you to go to the website again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but there's so many uh, resources there for you to, to look into. But, you know, really you can take like a 25 gauge needle, you just sort of insert it, you fan around the tumor site. Uh, it's literally that easy. I mean, this takes minutes. And Cristiano, that is an important, I think, element of this treatment because we are used to booking out surgeries, you know. I mean, even if it was, you know, on an extremity, I know that I've got to block out, you know, 30 minutes, an hour of surgical time. We've got anesthesia. We've got pre-anesthetic blood tests. I mean, there's a lot to do it, to go into the treatment. And, and yet now this paradigm shift, as I'll keep repeating as well, uh, it changes everything. I mean, I, I'd like for you to speak a little bit about, you know, how this can save time. Ultimately, I think it saves money for the pet parent, but I mean, I, I think this is an important discussion. Yeah, well, well, we all know how busy clinics are since the, the pandemic start, right? With the parking lot and the clients asking for more services uh, at every visit. In fact, there was a really nice article on, on JAFMA about this just recently. Uh, so I hear from many of my colleagues saying, I'm booked out for surgeries for four to six weeks. And my clients hate that because when they need a surgery, they want it now. Stelfonta, you don't need a surgery suite. In most cases, you don't need sedation. Uh, you don't need anesthesia. So you can do it in the office or in the back room there, the famous back room in five minutes. It doesn't take all that preparation time from your staff, the cleaning up time, somebody watching that dog recover from anesthesia. So you free up a lot of resources in your clinic to take care of the other problems Clients get you know, a very quick response on their mast cell tumors, but all the other clients that need surgery also get their dogs moving up the queue. So I've, I've seen more clinics using Stelfonta for several reasons, but also for this uh, streamlining their treatment. Uh, the, the other thing is when I ask doctors how much money you make on surgery, the many don't know and many say not enough. I cannot charge for surgeries as much as I to make as much money as I make seeing clients. So they also like to do less mast cell surgeries or do, do a stealth on the treatment in five minutes and have another 15 to 20 minutes to see other clients. Yeah, that's a really good point, Dr. Jones. I mean, this doesn't take long and the technical abilities are, are I think, very minimal. I think, you know, when I'm talking to vets, they say, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I feel comfortable. I'm like, do you feel comfortable doing a cutaneous block? I mean, can you not inject, you know, a lidocaine, <laughs> bupivacaine? Uh, so maybe just quickly discuss the technical aspects of this treatment. I mean, you're like, yeah, it's so simple. I, I, <laughs> this will take you like 30 seconds. I know. And, you know, the other day we were sharing cases with some of the general practitioners that are using it. And and literally what you do is you grasp that that mass between your thumb and index fingers. Um, there's a photo um, on the slide, the next slide where you aim for a single entry point and then you just fan that throughout there. Yeah. And, and Cristiano mentioned, you know, most dogs don't need sedation. If it's a sensitive area, you may need to sedate them for just to, just to basically, as I always say, get their undivided attention. Um, but it does take less than 10 minutes. And most of the vets, like I said, the general practitioners, they say, don't overthink this part of it, you know, concentrate on fanning it throughout, but don't overthink it. And, you know, Ernie, that brings up another point, you know, talking about schedules. I think veterinarians are very, uh, they're worried about how do I fit this new drug in? It's so different. And, you know, most people say do the screening the week before they talk to the owner about the diagnosis and then they start the concomitant medication, say on Friday and have them drop off on Monday and say, look, Monday morning, if you've given all the concomitant medications, we're going to do this treatment. And then most general practitioners are telling me that they don't recheck them in two days. They don't recheck them in a week. In fact, the 
good news is we all have digital cameras in our pockets and they all say, oh yeah, I have the technician call them on the second day. And then I just have the owner commit to sending me photos every three days, every day, once a week, that kind of thing. And then they just do a recheck in a month to take look at the healing site. I'm really glad you mentioned that because that is also a reservation I've encountered from veterinarians. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, gosh, you know, what, I mean, they've got this open wound. You have to check it every day. You have to change a dressing. You have to dress. I mean, you, all those things. And, and Cristiano, this is again, that paradigm shift. I'm sorry to the viewers, but you know, you leave it open. You don't touch it. You, the less you do, the better. I mean, help me out here. That's correct. And, and again, it's a change, right? We, we are used to manage ones, right? You put that picky collar so the dog won't lick it. You think about antibiotic coverage, topical stuff on it. Uh, we get asked about laser and this and the other. Uh, those are all great things. But what we have here is a different kind of wound to begin with, right? It's not a traumatic wound. It's not a wound that has uh, debris, that has dirt in it, that is, has ragged edges. What we see is really clean edges, really round edges. And we have a drug that it's there uh, working with the inflammatory system and the healing system and preventing the proliferation of, uh, of microbes and pathogens. So it really heals nicely without any intervention, which makes it very easy for the, the client that doesn't need to do anything at home doesn't see the dog in a cone, which is another thing that doesn't annoy the vet much, but annoys the client terribly. And uh, it's easy on us because we don't need to recheck and manage uh, at different phases of that wound. It, it's basically easy to do. Yeah, it is. Pam, one of the things too that, you know, I, again, I'm just kind of getting the, the pushback that I've heard from colleagues around the country <laughs> since Delfano was, was introduced in this country. And, you know, they, they say, wow, the client just won't accept this open wound, right? You guys keep mentioning this open wound. My clients will freak out. They'll be terrified of it. They won't know what to do. They'll call me every five minutes. Oh my gosh. But yet that really hasn't been the real world experience, has it? Not at all. And, you know, I, speaking from experience as a radiation oncologist, I've been prepping owners for radiation side effects for 25 years. And as long as they know what's coming, they expect it. In fact, you look pretty brilliant when it goes along just as expected. And what I mean is, is when you say, look, two more days from now, this is going to look much better. And two more days from now, it's nearly healed. They're just ecstatic. They can't even believe it. Um, you know, about the only thing that I hear is even if you prep them for the smell, they're not used to necrotic smell. <laughs> so around that day three to five, they may be like, oh, that smell is really there. But once that tissue sloughs off and is gone, that smell goes away. And, and I think it's, it's really a big deal that you know, again, I, it's hard to explain, but these wounds are way above the curve. They're past all the roadblocks of those nasty traumatic wounds. I'll be the first to tell you that, you know, managing a degloving and getting it to heal is one of the most rewarding things. But this is amazing because this makes our management look like child's play because <laughs> yeah. it just all on its own, you know, it, it's, it heals. And I know you've, you now have a, a pretty big body of, of evidence to show how quickly they do heal. Maybe could you just explain like what percentage, you know, heal within, you know, a few weeks, within a couple of months? What, what does it look like? Yes, our, our largest our largest um, study was the safety and efficacy study done in the United States, which if the readers want to go go check it out, it is what's called um, open access. So you can get that article. But if you go to the slide, you know, out of 117 patients in this study, by day 28, 56 percent were healed by day 42, 78 percent. And the end of that study, day 84, uh, 96%. There were only three dogs that weren't completely healed by the end of that study. They were the ones with the largest wounds. They did go on to complete healing without intervention. So um, quite amazing that, again, all those wounds healed. And as you'll see here, I really, if you look at it, only a few dogs had intervention. One was bandaged, one was treated with saline to reduce odor. And this is the crazy part, again, for veterinarians to get is, only two dogs were ever uh, wore an Elizabethan collar to protect the wound. 
Yeah, and, and I remember when that dropped, I was like, wait, what? Is this a typo? You know, because that your our, our traditional fallback is we do surgery, we put on an e-collar. And it, so much so that it's a joke, right? I mean, pet owners joke about this cone. Uh, and yet here's a situation where we've taken a procedure that was always given an e-collar and now no e-collar, almost no intervention. And honestly, if you're listening, the best advice that Cristiano has already given I recommend, and I think many of our colleagues that have had any experience so far would say, let the owner snap a picture, send it into your text, you know, whatever, you know, every few days, just make sure it looks good. And, and you know, Cristiano, honestly, I think half the time it's more for the pet parents benefit, you know, than for ours, because you're looking at it, it looks great. Yeah, we're basically cheerleading them and reassuring, right? We tell, we look at a picture and say, okay, the, we, I see the necrosis. The product is working. Great news. And you tell them that, no, that's what you want to see. It's going black. Uh, the tumor is dying. And in fact, we send them to the website where there's a video explaining how it works. And there's a silhouette of a dog with dots on it or hexagons. You can click on that and see pictures of several different cases that in different locations, different breeds of dogs. So they can always find something that's similar location to their, uh, the tumor that their dog has and they can see those those pictures in advance. And then we just reassure them, yes, that's what we expect. And, and as Pam said, in two days it's gonna look like this. So they kind of know the prognosis and what, what to look for. And they love it, they celebrate. They love to see the tumor dying. It's very visual, right? They see the cancer dying. They see the, the parts that you don't want on your dog getting out. There's just a good healthy dog being left and then healing that tissue deficit. Uh, it, it's a disconnect, right, Ernie, because we as veterinarians, we are really happy with anesthesia. We don't, don't worry about it. It's really safe. We do the, the sutures. So we think it's nice and clean and close. And we send a dog home with that big bark amplifier around the head. Uh, the owners hate the, the, the cone. Uh, the dog gets annoyed with the stitches. If they take the cone out, many times they'll pull it off and open it all again. Sending it with the wound home, it's scary for us veterinarians with the necrotic tumor in the wound. We are scared. We think, well, the owner might not handle that well. They're doing great. They love it. Right. And, and you know, one of the things, too, I know anybody that's seen me lecture over the last 25 years, I've always contended and, and stand by this to this day, that the biggest barrier to things like even dentistry is the fear of anesthesia. You know, everybody's got a story about a dog or cat who went to the vet for some surgery, some anesthesia and never came home. And so I, I would I would really encourage my colleagues to say, OK, is surgery anesthesia actually a barrier to treatment and if so then this uh, completely ameliorates that that argument right i mean it's like no we don't need to do i mean maybe you can do a sedation if the dog is, is you know is, if you yeah. feel like it needs it uh, to get their full undivided attention i love that pam but you know my point is <laughs> you you remove that barrier and i think it, it really encourages treatment and, and christiana one thing too another barrier that i think a lot of vets that aren't familiar yet with stelfanta is they say well okay this all sounds really good but it's it's got to cost a fortune, but you, Verbac is really committed to, to getting this in the hands of as many veterinarians and to treat as many pet patients as possible. That's true. Uh, between Verbac and QBiotics, we, we work this out to cut every cost possible and bring it at a price that is comparable to surgery. So the decision that the veterinarian, that pet owner want to make is what's going to be best for that patient, for that owner, for that the treatment of that tumor without having to worry, is this going to be more expensive? In the vast majority of cases, the treatment with Stelfonta will be comparable to surgery. Uh, sometimes it's less expensive even. Uh, sometimes it's a slightly uh, more costly depending on the size of the dog and location of the tumor and size of the tumor. But the owners are very happy to, uh, to opt for this uh, therapy, as we said, and, and not have anesthesia or surgery. There are a couple of things that I want to emphasize uh, about the stuff we talked uh, before. One is, yes, the, the wounds heal really well and all that, but we, we do want to tell the clients that, particularly for those subcutaneous tumors, sometimes you can't guess the exact size of that tumor. And sometimes the wound is a bit bigger than you expected. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're thinking the tumor maybe is three, four centimeters, that wound might be five or six. It, they do heal quickly too. They do heal very fast and very well. The larger the wound, the longer it takes. So those dogs that took three months or 84 days to heal are the ones that had, as Pam said, the bigger tumors, bigger ones. 
So you want to tell them, you know, we might have a larger one in a few cases, they heal well, it's no big deal. The other thing is, uh, you do want to be, when you're injecting the tumor, you want to sedate the dog that when you do the fine needle aspirate is twitching. You want to sedate the dog that has a tumor close to the eye, you want a sensitive location like that, right? And you also want to sedate the dog that you cannot hold well because you don't want to self-inject. Right? We, I, we all injected dogs with many different drugs and now that the dog moves and you prick yourself with that needle, you want to minimize that risk because in some cases when uh, you self-inject, you might get some inflammation and even a, a wound on the location of that injection, right? It will heal too, but you want to avoid that. Yeah, and I love that because, again, very few pet parents have reservations about sedation. Take the edge off. Chill them out just a little. You know, people can relate to that, but when it's full-on anesthesia, I'm telling you there is still a fear there that is inherent, and we have to deal with it. Uh, uh, Pam, real quick here, you know, I, I, Christiana mentioned that sometimes the, the – the, the area of, the, of necrosis is larger than we expected. And I think there's been some evidence or if, if, you know, again, empirical versus anecdotal, but sometimes this is because they have better vasculature, right? I mean, some of these tumors, we just didn't realize how far they were kind of spreading or about to spread. Yeah, it's it's so true. And, and while we can predict probably 95 to 98% of these wounds and, and what they're gonna do, you know, there is a very small percentage as Cristiano mentioned that, you know, we feel a mass and it's subcutaneous and it, and it may just be the tip of the iceberg. And so we end up with a larger wound. And, and it's, you know, even a couple of the veterinarians I've talked to in the last couple of weeks have told me, oh, this thing literally found the margins I was not going to be able to get. And these are, you know, talking about wounds on the lower limbs and yet they heal fine. And I think that's the biggest thing about it is, is, is if that were to occur, they do heal well. We did find that that dogs with enlarged lymph nodes that weren't documented as metastatic may, may have a larger wound, high grade tumors, and certainly larger tumors are gonna have high, larger wounds. Yeah, it, it, again, it's remarkable because I love what you just said there. You, these, this Stelfanta finds the margins I couldn't have found or even accomplished otherwise. And that really bears repeating because if, you've, if you're like me, you've, always, you've had these on the digit or on the muzzle where there just wasn't a lot of extra real estate there you know, to, to work with. And so you knew when you went into that surgery, you're going to be having pretty thin margins. This just, again, completely obviates that. It's this, this does it for you, which, again, remarkable. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you for developing this tumor. <laughs> now, now, Pam, you've had the opportunity over the past several months to meet with veterinarians all over the country. Uh, mm -hmm. What's been kind of the feedback that you're hearing out there? You know, people saying they like it or they wish it did this or that. I mean, what, what's your feedback been? It's really been a fun thing to see because, you know, I, I working with QBiotics for more than two years now, I've seen all the cases, I've seen the healing. In fact, just yesterday, I was showing a picture to a friend of mine saying, I can't even believe this healed this way. But it's interesting because back a few months when, ago when we first launched the drug, veterinarians were like, yeah, I did my first case, it went well, I'm on my second case. And they would say, I think it fits in some places. Now, when I talk to veterinarians that have treated 10, 15, 20 cases, they're like, oh, this is complete in line with surgery. It's every case I see that's a mast cell tumor, I think about this is another uh, tool in my toolbox that I can use for local tumor control. And it and they, they immediate, it's right up there at front with surgery. And again, depending on the factors that are present, it may take precedence over surgery. And this is going from veterinarians, not from me. I mean, literally, I'm, I'm surprised when a surgical veterinarian tells me this, you know. Yeah. And again, Cristiano, uh, to be clear, this is something that a general practitioner, just a regular vet like me, this is something that we are well equipped and capable of, of performing, right? Yes, that's correct. In fact, uh, you know, the uh, one question we get is, is this going to be available for general practitioners? Because we are used for, uh, with those chemotherapy drugs for cancer, that they, those drugs are restricted to the specialist, to the oncologist. Well, first, Stelfonta is not one of those drugs that you need a special hood or all those special protections. It's not toxic like some of those chemotherapeutic drugs. Uh, the care you need to take is uh, eyewear. So if it sprays around when you're injecting, it doesn't hit your eyes. You want to wear gloves and you want to use just a, a normal coat to protect uh, your skin if it sprays around. 
And then you want to use a lure lock syringe because when you're injecting it into the tumor, you're putting some pressure. You don't want the needle to become detached from the syringe. Other than that, there's no special care there. The drug is available to every general practitioner. And those are the people that are really doing most of the mast cell tumor surgeries and curing most of the mast cell tumors. The other point there is uh, don't wait for that case that you cannot do surgery, that you need to amputate a, a toe or a leg to start. I see lots of clinics saying, oh, Stelfont is really nice. I'm going to use it on the next case I cannot do surgery. Well, the best case to offer it for your client is the next case that walks through the door. And in fact, if you start, if you do your first one with a smaller tumor on the body of the dog, it's much easier for you and your staff to get used to how it works, to you know, debug the system, to communicate with the client, get that experience and get more confident to do the mass big ones later on. Yeah, and you know, Cristiano, one, one other little quick anecdote, and, and Pam, I'm sure you've heard the same thing. A lot of younger and ex less experienced veterinarians, you know, they may not have the surgical skills or, or skills or the confidence to actually, you know, perform some of these surgeries. And this is a tool that we can give them. And, you know, I was talking to an owner of, of a few practices recently about this because he was complaining, like a lot of owners, about, you know, the young vets, you know, don't want to do the <laughs> surgery, right? I mean, sorry, but, you know, it's true. And uh, and so I was saying, well, look, you know, here's an opportunity to to give them a new skill, a new ability. And, you know, and, and I could tell the light bulb was starting to go off you know i could tell he was going hey you're right you know because instead of us trying to shuttle all the you know to the one vet all the surgeries now we have a one or two week wait or whatever uh wait yeah we could they should be able to do this of course they can do this i could tell that uh pam while we're kind of talking about that um you know what about from pet parents i mean you obviously you've spent your career dealing with some pretty tough cases you know doing a lot of you know radiation you know oncology and and this what are you hearing from pet parents and, and because i'm i'm asking because you've got the real experience, the perspective of seeing, I mean, let's face it, a lot of the radiation therapies that I've referred my pet patients to, they're, they're tough to manage. And now you're seeing something maybe a little different. Yeah, it's, it, again, it's, it's amazing because they really, again, they embrace this when they know that there's another thing they can do to treat their dog for a mast cell tumor without anesthesia, without a lot of, um, you know, a lot of visits to the veterinarian, they are happy. And it's, and it, what amazes me is, you know, it, and, and I hate to turn to social media, but boy, I, I'm amazed at how much they embrace this. In fact, if I really had to say it, I would say that in my 25 year career, this is probably the um, the biggest drug that I have seen driven by the pet parent. You know, the pet parent is asking for it. And the other thing about it is too, you know, a lot of these cutaneous mast cell tumors are what we call repeat customers. You know, these are dogs that develop mast cell tumors throughout their life. And what's amazing to me is these clients, once they've used it for one, they request it in the future. So they want it to be used if their dog comes up with another one. Yeah, Pam, I couldn't agree more. The the social media has lit a fire around Stelfanta. So, uh, and I'll tell you a, another frustrating story, Cristiano, and, and one that it, I don't want any of our viewers to ever make this mistake. But, you know, I, because of my media, you know, things, uh, I get a lot of just random questions from pet parents, concerned pet parents. And a, f a couple, about two or three months ago, uh, shortly after the launch, kind of in that new new part of the phase, uh, I got a random email from you know a pet parent somewhere, and she said, "Look, my dog's been diagnosed with this type of cancer." cell tumors, you know anything about it? And my vet is trying to get me to do this experimental drug, which of course, none of that is exactly true, but you can understand the miscommunication. But here was the frustrating thing. Nobody, at least you know, she didn't say, say anything or know about it, had directed her to the website. And all I had to do, this person was hesitant. They were reserved. They didn't understand what was going on. What was this new drug? They thought it was experimental when it really wasn't. And I said, look, I, I sent her the hyperlinks <laughs> to the Stelfonta <laughs> page and I said, check this out. I said, just really take a look because I think this could be absolutely the best and potentially life-saving treatment for your dog. And that did it. Like she emailed me back like a few days later, said, hey, I had a chance to look at the website. I clicked on it. They had, had a where my dog's tumor was and I could see exactly what to expect. So I'm going to schedule with my vet. Thank you very much. I, I will tell you, if you have a, a client who is hesitant 
send them to this website because that will, I, Christiana, I'd have to argue that would, that would probably convince the most skeptical pet parent. It's really well done. Yeah, we, we are very aware on how difficult communication with clients it is on a regular basis. And even more now with the parking lot situation, still in some clinics, with the, the busy uh, schedule that we have in the clinics. And this is a product that's very visual. So we wanted to have those visuals on the website, uh, have a video, have pictures, have things that will facilitate that communication between the doctor and the owner. Because the owners do embrace the product, but you want them to be well-educated. You want them to understand what's gonna happen, right? You, you don't want them to be surprised by the tumor going black and falling off and the leaving a tissue deficit. And that's the, what the website does. You send them over there uh, or, or you show, you know, put the video on on the screen in your practice, show them in the practice and then answer their questions and, and clarify any, any doubts. It is really uh, something that is going around in the social media. Many owners pay, put their Facebook page to show the treatment of their dog or their Instagram. Uh, so there's a lot of information out there. We wanted to make sure that the good information is there. The other important thing to say is the website has two different parts. One part that it's accessible to the pet owners that has all that pet owner education. And then we have a vet page that is only for veterinarians. So you need to put your name and your license number there. That then has the frequent ask questions for the vets, the dose calculator, all the behind the curtain stuff that the vets need to know to do the treatment. So the, the website has those two functions and we keep them separate. Yeah, and definitely go ahead and sign up today because in anticipation of the next mast cell tumor that walks in your door, that's, I mean, you want to be ready for it. So as we sort of close out today, Pam, any last words of advice or encouragement for a veterinarian who's still kind of sitting on the fence and go, yeah, I hear this, but a lot of new stuff comes, you know, I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit back and watch. I mean, any last bits of encouragement? Yeah, so my encouragement is going to be, uh, you know, if you're hesitant, talk to, you know, one of the field technical service vets from Verbac attend a webinar where you can hear a colleague talking about their experience. And I'm sure we could even get you in touch with somebody who's been using it, you know, so they can tell you their experience. So, so hear from a colleague because there's nothing better than talk to, talking to a colleague about what they've done or what they've seen. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And Cristiano, any last bit of advice, you know, from, from Veerback, your support, you know, anything that can, yes, uh, can encourage I have, that? Well, first I echo Pam's words, right? Talk to other veterinarians that used it. The other thing I want you to be aware of is when you get Stelfonta, uh, you will see that on the label, there is boxed warnings. Right on the top of the label, you have this box with some text inside. That's a tool FDA uses to get us to pay attention to what's really important. And what you're gonna see there is the stuff we just talked about, right? Is reminding you not to forget the concomitant medications to manage the risk of degranulation. It's talking about you know, using a lure box syringe and protective equipment, not self-injecting. Uh, so the, the, those are really the, 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 your checklist for success. You want to take a look at those, make sure you calculate the dose right. And after that, it's really easy and simple to use Telfonta. And the results are amazingly consistent. It's really easy to predict how it's going to perform. And, and that's what makes it easy for us to manage the clients. Yeah, I got to tell you again, on behalf of veterinarians, veterinary technicians, pet parents everywhere, thank you guys for developing this because this solves a problem, a dilemma, a real life threatening situation that so many vets deal with on a daily basis. And, you know, again, an elegant solution, high safety, highly efficacious. I mean, Again, it's it's great to be a vet these days because, you know, I mean, Pam, you and I are probably sitting there dialing back the Rolodex going, yep, I wish I had it then or for that case because you didn't do maybe the job you thought you should. So, so guys, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, just, just go back to, you know, you and I as veterinarians and, you know, we always think of tumor factors and patient factors as to why we should or shouldn't recommend a certain type of treatment. And I, as an oncologist, I'm always bringing in those owner factors because owners, you know, they, they worry about their pets having anesthesia. They worry about, you know, having any collar on. They worry about having a, a wound that they have to protect and bandage and, and, 
And this takes away a lot of those worries. So I think it's really important to to realize that and bring this into you know use. I had a veterinarian the other day that she used it. They've got a fear-free practice and she used it on a patient that absolutely she could have never done surgery on. And um, it was just brilliant. You know, I was like, wow, I can't believe this. You had this dog come in for literally a 10 minute visit and you were done. And you cured a cancer. <laughs> and you cured a cancer. It was, it, was the, it was the greatest case because I'd never thought of that. And she preemptively thought it's a boxer. It's got a mast cell tumor yeah. probably. I'm gonna start the prednisone two days before she comes in. We're gonna have her on trazodone and all the things. She diagnosed it did whatever she had to do that day diagnostic wise, injected it, sent the dog home and did the rest through just telemedicine, getting photos from the owner every couple of days. Yeah, remarkable, great. Thank you yeah. guys so much. Thanks for having us, Ernie. Yeah, thank well, you. Listen, thank you guys so much for joining us today. I mean, again, we are so proud at Vertical Vet to partner with companies like Verbac who are bringing groundbreaking therapeutics and treatments to your patient. So again, if you want to find out more, you can definitely check them out at Verbac, uh, talk to your Verbac rep, or you can talk to us at verticalvet.com. We'd be glad to steer you in the right direction. Again, on the entire for the entire team here at Vertical Vet, we want to thank you for your time today. And uh, again, it's been my pleasure to, to bring this kind of information to you on a regular basis. I'm Dr. Ernie Ward, Executive Director of Education for Vertical Vet. Until next time, bye.